So we are live. We should. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. I see that we are recording. So, uh, welcome everyone to this uh, second episode of the Media Infrared Discussions webinar series. I'm Simone Deliberato, and together with uh, Vincenzo Giannini and Stefan Meyer, I'll serve as host for this event. Just a few words of introduction. We decided to organize the MIDI webinar series to offer the different communities working on MIDI infrared nanophotonics uh, an opportunity to showcase results and foster collaborations. Before the pandemic, we were working to organize a physical conference on phonon polaritons. So we decided to focus the first batch of speakers on phonon polariton science and technology. According to the feedback we will receive uh, into the constantly evolving uh, COVID-19 situation, we aim to then expand the focus toward uh, other technological platforms uh, such as uh, intersubband uh, polaritons uh, and mid infrared plasmonics. In this second uh, installment, uh, we are honored to have with us today Professor Joshua Caldwell, who will give uh, his talk, uh, Strong Coupling in Polaritonic Media toward on-chip uh, infrared nanophotonics. Josh is a Flowers Family Chancellor, Faculty Fellow, and Associate Professor at Vanderbilt University. And before that, he spent 10 years as permanent staff at the Naval Research Laboratory. He is a four-time recipient of the Alan Bergman Best Pure Science Paper Award, of the Thomas Edison Best Patent Award, and uh, he was recently elected a Fellow of the Material Research Society. Josh is also one of the reasons this webinar series exists uh, as I got personally interested in the whole uh, phonon polariton business after reading his uh, seminal paper on localized phonon polaritons in silicon carbide uh, back in 2013. Uh, some practical information before leaving the virtual floor uh, to Professor Caldwell. The talk will last roughly 45 minutes, uh, followed by time for questions. In order to ask questions after the talk, uh, you can use the Q&A button on the Zoom interface. You can either just write voice, uh, I will unmute you and you can ask your question, or if you prefer, you can just write your question in full in the Q&A box and I will read your question aloud. Uh, please note this webinar will be recorded and it could be shared online, including questions. Okay, I'm done. Please, Josh. All right. Uh, so let me just get my screen up. And how did I do this before? There we go. Sorry about that. Hang on a second. Oh. Sorry. This is the Zoom issue here. There we go. All right, so everybody can see the intro slide? Yep, okay. you can go. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction and also for uh, the invitation to be, well, be here in my office at home. Uh, Madrid sounds a lot better than my office at home right now, but we'll uh, go with what we got. Um, I really appreciate having these uh, 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 webinar series put together, though. This gives us an opportunity to uh, discuss and actually uh, continue to talk about science uh, from afar with uh, folks that uh, might be a little bit more difficult in this time. Um, so my email address is down here. If there's anything beyond the discussion of what um, uh, anything further beyond uh, what we talk about here that you'd like to discuss afterwards, I'd be happy to uh, discuss those with you directly. Uh, let me just put up my pointer uh, down here. Uh, so I'm actually going to continue on the wonderful talk from Professor Graffet last week uh, discussing mid-infrared uh, phonon polaritons, but also plasmon polaritons. 
uh, and kind of discussing into the concept of strong coupling for uh, controlling the interaction between these uh, different types of modes and how that can be used for uh, uh, dictating things such as spatial coherence, uh, electrical stimulation of some of these uh, uh, phonon flare tone modes, as well as also um, uh, controlling line widths and light contents. So with that, <clears throat> we're talking about nanophotonics. Uh, so just kind of give a brief introduction. Of course, if we're looking at uh, traditional uh, non, non or low uh, dispersive materials, uh, the diffraction limit causes a significant problem if we want to realize nanophotonics in the uh, long wave or even the mid wave infrared. For instance, we're in the long wave infrared at about 10 micron wavelengths. Uh, of course, with indices of refraction limited to one or two to four, uh, uh, this uh, means the most we're going to confine light is on the order of uh, a couple microns. So certainly not getting into this nanoscale dimension. Right? This is a challenge because, of course, Abby's diffraction limit is quite literally written in stone in the University of Jena. Uh, so if we want to overcome this, what we have to do is find a different way for light and matter to interact. And one way to do that is through the formation of a uh, strong coupling, uh, the formation of what's called a polariton, right? And this uh, can be uh, comprised of a photon of light and some coherent oscillating charge, right? The idea here is you could take this polariton and uh, you take this uh, polariton and the you maintain the information of the photon, for instance, its polarization, its energy, and now you compress that wavelength through the strong coupling phenomena down to a length scale uh, approaching that of the that of the wavelength of the charged particle, right? And so you can diverge away from uh, the free space wavelength and now get uh, extremely high compression of their free space light. So this gives us a way to overcome the diffraction limit uh, and therefore realize nanophotonics in the mid to long wave infrared or even far infrared and terahertz. All right, so there's a whole broad suite of different forms of flaretons. This is from a review from uh, Dimitri Bassa, Misha Fogler, and Javier Garcia de Bajo, um, uh, focusing on polaritons and 2D materials. However, this is equally uh, relevant when we're talking about bulk uh, semiconductors or bulk materials as well. So if we take that photon and we couple it with an oscillating electronic charge, for instance, a free carrier plasma, uh, electrons or holes, you can realize a surface plasma on polariton. This is probably the most widely studied, and of course, in two-dimensional materials, graphene has been uh, garnering significant interest because of its tunability, uh, as well as uh, uh, some of the highest compression ratios uh, reported for propagating modes. But that's only one of the choices. We can also look at the ionic charges on a polar lattice, uh, which can allow us to support things like phonon flaretons, which of course, in the context of two-dimensional materials, uh, can give us hexagonal boron nitride. Now, these are both showing two different uh, hex, uh, two different two-dimensional materials that can support these kind of modes. Equally, we can look at highly doped semiconductors in the mid-infrared. For instance, I'll talk about a transparent conducting oxide, cadmium oxide today, as well as also uh, uh, bulk semiconductor materials or dielectric materials such as silicon carbide or quartz. There's also more exotic forms, for instance, exciton polaritons, uh, for instance, within transition metals of tachogenides, uh, Cooper Paris uh, polaritons and semi, uh, superconductors, as well as also magnon polaritons within magnetic media. Uh, but for today's talk, we're going to focus our attention here on uh, these two types uh, in the context of both on chip photonics, but then beginning with uh, thermal emission, continuing on from Professor Perfet's talk last week. Okay, so I think most of us probably have a fairly good concept about the light coupling with the free charge in a uh, uh, plasmon flareton material. If we look at these phonon flareton materials, there's a lot of uh, similarities, uh, except in this case, instead of coupling at, uh, to an electronic charge, we're looking at the bound charge on a polar lattice. For instance, in silicon carbide, I have uh, the difference in electronegativity makes silicon partially positive and carbon partially negative. And thus, if I stimulate an optic phonon, for instance, between the, uh, at the frequency between the transverse optic and longitudinal optic phonons, I can get this coherent oscillation of the ionic charge now, which can screen out the incident radiation and cause a very high reflectivity, which can actually be more reflective than metals in the spectral range um, uh, within that band, right? This corresponds to a negative real part of the dielectric function, much like in a metal uh, below the plasma frequency. 
Uh, and thus, we can now uh, support surface, plasma, uh, surface phonon polaritons as long as that condition is met. And therefore, light can be confined to these subdiffractional dimensions. Right? Um, now, this is defined by this uh, dispersion relationship here rather than a Druda form, where this is still a Lorentz oscillator, but now it has bounds between the LO and TO phonons. Right? And so this means that we have a bandwidth over which we can operate that's material dependent. But it also means that the dispersion of the, uh, of the polaritonic mode or the dispersion in the permittivity is quite rapid within this range. And thus the group velocity, which is the derivative of that dispersion, is quite slow. So for uh, opportunities where you want slow light, phonon polaritons provide a very low loss and very slow light uh, uh, medium to operate with. And of course, you can choose a whole broad range of these different materials based off of the uh, overall uh, material choice, gives you uh, a broad range of frequencies over which you can operate. <clears throat> okay, now there's one significant challenge when trying to operate, uh, uh, manipulate flaretons, and that is actually coupling to these modes. So if I look at the dispersion relationship, right, I can see for free space light in vacuum, I have a linear dispersion as would be expected between the frequency of light and momentum, right? This is just the reciprocal of the uh, modal wavelength. So as I go up in frequency, my wavelength is going down. My wave vector is going up to higher momentum, right? If I look at one of these polaritons here, I'm demonstrating this for a plasmon polariton. You see at low frequencies, this uh, coincides with that of the light line. But as I go to higher frequency and approach lower values of the uh, uh, negative permittivity, you see that this uh, uh, asymptotically diverges from uh, this light line and approaches that where the negative part of my permittivity of the uh, uh, plasmonic material uh, is equal and opposite in sign to that of the local dielectric. So an air permittivity of negative one, right? So this diverge, it's out here where this huge divergence occurs that I get that very large wavelength compression. This also means that at the same frequency of light, I have a huge momentum mismatch. And because I need to conserve energy and momentum, I can't just directly stimulate these polaritons from free space. So you need ways to overcome that. And some of these can be uh, realized by using high index prisms, for instance, in the Kretschmann geometry or the auto geometry, where I'm coming in and I'm using the high index of the, polar of the uh, uh, prism to actually slow the light down, go to uh, higher momentum for instance, zinc selenide here, and therefore tilt that light line. And by doing so, I can come in at this higher momentum, stimulate a polariton at this point here that can be supported in air on the opposite side of that film. This is the Kretschmann configuration, or I can use auto configuration and do this by coupling the uh, uh, evanescent field of the total internal reflection at the prism with that of uh, the polaritonic field on the surface of the uh, uh, underlying material to get this mode to be supported in this gap between them. I can also increase the momentum through coupling through a grating or through resonance structures. And uh, as I'll get through this talk, you'll see we'll use each one of these in some form or another throughout uh, the talk. Okay, so we're gonna focus first on using phonon polaritons as a means of achieving narrow band thermal emitters in the long wave IR. And this is actually motivated quite heavily by uh, the seminal work from uh, Professor Griffey that he highlighted last week. Just to remind you, in that case, he looked at a uh, uh, silicon carbide grating. This is back in 2002, where the grating period was such that uh, uh, you could get diffractive modes uh, for long wave infrared light at the roughly 10 to 12 microns. And by doing so, you could take what ordinarily is a completely incoherent light source, just thermal emission, and now coupling these, uh, thermally stimulating these surface phonon polaritons and coupling them into this grating structure, I can get this diffraction of all of these thermally emitted modes that lead to exceptionally high spatial coherence for these, uh, or directionality uh, for the emitted phonon polariton mode. So I'm inducing, in this case, he was able to induce spatial coherence into something that's nominally completely temporally and spatially incoherent. Later on, there was some work from Mark Van Gersma's group um, uh, with John Schuler as the lead author, uh, where they used micron uh, scale micro whiskers of silicon carbide, and they were able to demonstrate that the thermal emission from the localized resonances in these systems and these structures give rise to uh, uh, polarized far field thermal emission. 
So the polarization of the polaritonic mode actually is retained into the far field, meaning you can realize a uh, polarized light source doing this. And then later on, in collaboration with Thomas Taubner, uh, I was able to, uh, my group was able to uh, demonstrate uh, uh, very narrow band thermal emitters, as narrow as about three wave numbers, um, whereby heating this up as a function of temperature, you can induce these narrow resonances that can give rise to uh, uh, basically uh, amplitude dependent uh, modes that are not spectrally shifting with temperature very much. So by increasing the temperature at which you're operating, you can get this narrow band emission uh, stronger and stronger using this uh, uh, thermal emission concept, right? And now by doing this, if you combine all three of these and you could do this in a single package, you could potentially realize a spatially coherent polarized narrow band source in the long wave infrared, which would operate like an LED, but not require any active region. Uh, it would be basically just a simple nanostructure uh, design with a local heat source. And this is enabled by these phonon polaritons, which if I make these structures, for instance, these are some of the original structures we made uh, in collaboration with Stefan Meyer's group, where you can see these uh, roughly 200 nanometer structures uh, fabricated into a silicon carbide substrate gives rise to these very narrow thermal emission, uh, uh, narrow uh, uh, absorption bands within the Rostralin band of silicon carbide, which can have exceptionally large Q factors. Uh, in our work, we were able to show up to about 300. More recent work uh, from Federico Capasso's group has shown that you can get this extended up to about 400, and now with Sang Han Oh, uh, approaching 500 uh, uh, quality factors for quantum polariton modes. But they also have a very high modal volume, uh, a very small modal volume, right? So this could lead to large potential for cell factors for enhancing optical processes. And they're fully tunable, as I showed you before, by changing the material, I can change what spectral range I'm operating in. But of course, changing the size, shape, the periodicity of these structures, or uh, aspect ratio, I can dictate how these, uh, uh, the resonant modes, where they occur within the Rostralin band and what their modal polarization, uh, as well as also profiles look like. So these are driven by a local heat source. So this, gave uh, uh, one of my grad students, Guan Yu Lu, we started having this uh, idea of doing a, um, uh, a waste heat driven uh, thermal emitter, whereby uh, we wanted to look at could be induced spatial coherence into these structures and is there sufficient energy to actually stimulate these modes using just a local uh, waste heat from either a CPU or a combustion engine or something of that sort. And so in collaboration with the Naval Research Lab, uh, Marco Tadger fabricated these structures here uh, so that we could get a large, uh, large area structure. This is about a, a, centimeter, uh, a centimeter on a side with the concept of being able to get a large enough structure so we could measure the angular spread of the thermal emission. And you can see again from these structures, these give rise to relatively narrow resonances uh, that don't spectrally shift very much as I increase the temperature. Furthermore, if I look at overlapping two resonant modes, I can actually get uh, a, a strong enough resonance that uh, I get an emissivity approaching that of one. So I can get an almost perfect absorber at this uh, frequency uh, that also emits in both P and S polarized light. If for comparison, then uh, the flat substrate is over here, you can see within the Rostralin band effectively no thermal emission uh, because it's effectively a mirror. So then uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Greg Walker at Vanderbilt, we uh, developed a thermodynamic model uh, to see if I put this on a heat sink for, on -chip, uh, uh, for an on-chip light source, could I actually use just a rejected heat from that like 100 watt CPU to drive this device? And how much power could it get out? As well as how much of the area could I reasonably replace without uh, damaging the CPU? And so through this, these calculations and then experimental demonstration later, we're able to show you can uh, replace about 16 uh, square centimeters of a traditional 36 square centimeters heat sink with this NIRM device, these uh, uh, local uh, emitter devices, without having the temperature uh, be, uh, extend beyond that safe operating temperature of about 85 degrees. Now, furthermore, if I look at the uh, uh, amount of light that I can get out from this device, look at the yellow curve here, this shouldn't be 16, this should be about 12 actually, sorry for that uh, mistake there. But we get about 12 milliwatts within that Rostralin band from those localized resonances at only 85 degrees C. So this provides an opportunity to actually get a, uh, a 
narrowband light source that could operate off of just waste heat from a local device without damaging that device in any way, and therefore could potentially provide some additional useful function. Now, we wanted to then explore the radiation patterns of this. Of course, these are uh, uh, spaced at such a distance that uh, we should not have any diffractive effects. And so just to test that out, we looked at the P and S polarized light as a function of angle. And you can see exactly what we would expect is that these are relatively non-dispersive with uh, uh, change in the angle or the momentum. And thus the radiation patterns at any given frequency look uh, are either emitted directly into a hemisphere or for some of these dipole resonances, more like a, a double lobed uh, emission shown here. So how can we start to control some of the spatial uh, coherence of these modes? Well, it turns out there's actually some interesting phenomena that is, I'm not gonna say unique, but fairly uh, uh, unique to silicon carbide. in that if I look at uh, silicon carbide uh, uh, crystal structures, you have the purely cubic structure, which is uh, designated the 3C structure. But because of uh, the broad variety of different stacking orders of the silicon and carbon atoms that can be thermodynamically stable, there's actually 210 uh, known polytypes of silicon carbide that can be uh, found or, uh, or uh, made. Two of the more predominant ones for power electronics are 4H and 6H. Uh, 6H is usually a substrate for light emitting diodes uh, uh, based off three nitride materials. And what you find is that these are not purely hexagonal. The pure hexagonal form is 2H. 4H actually has both cubic and uh, hexagonal stacking orders, but this is more hexagonal than 6H, for instance. Now, because of that, you actually have two different unit cells, kind of like a super lattice uh, within um, uh, uh, a two different material super lattice. And thus, you end up with the dispersion of your LO phonon here also inducing some zone folding, right? And the zone folding occurs because of that dual uh, periodicity of the cubic and hexagonal uh, structures. So if I look at 4H, this is gonna uh, uh, fold over at about half, at, uh, half the brilliant zone, resulting in a uh, zone folded LO phonon at about 838 wave numbers. But as in this original work with Stefan Meyer back in 2013, uh, we use 6H, and this is, uh, folds over at a third of the brilliant zone, resulting in modes about 882 wave numbers. And there's actually two of these that are nominally degenerate, but uh, split a little bit here uh, for a variety of reasons that I can get into otherwise. But one of the interesting things that we observed was that as we shift one of these phonon polariton resonances towards this mode, the amplitude of these zone-folded phonon, uh, LO phonons that we ordinarily would not observe uh, become much stronger until they spectrally overlap and we see a strong coupling phenomena where the spectral frequencies of these uh, zone folded modes uh, become uh, a drop in absorption, right? So they become uh, forbidden transitions until it propagates through and then the strong coupling is lost. So if I look at that in a simplified state here, this is in collaboration with both Stefan and Simone, um, you could see the phonon polariton mode would have a dispersion like this line here. The zone folded LO phonon is non-dispersive, should be flat here. But in this coupled case, what you actually find is that as this, the energy of this phonon polariton mode approaches that of this zone folded LO phonon, I end up with a anti-crossing between the two modes. This is the definition of a strong coupling between these two, where the strength of that coupling is dictated by the separation here, which is called the Rabi splitting. Um, and one of the key benefits here is much like the polariton, what we're actually doing in the strong coupling case is both modes now take on some of the character of the other mode. So now we have something that has some of the uh, 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 properties of the uh, localized mode, uh, localized phonon polariton mode, but also the zone folded LO phonon. So why is that important? Well, one of the things that this provides us is if I look at the phonon polariton mode, these can emit into the far field, as I showed you through thermal emission, um, because they're transverse uh, fields and they're coupled. Uh, it's a coupling of a photon with a transverse optic phonon. However, these cannot be electrically stimulated because the fields are orthogonal to the longitudinal fields of the uh, free carrier based system, right? However, LO phonons can couple through a, uh, a, a ohmic loss. Uh, and therefore, we can stimulate LO phonons via uh, such a process. Now, by coupling these two together, we could take the longitudinal transverse phonon polariton, this strongly coupled mode I just showed you, 
and now potentially have something where I could generate an omic uh, through omic losses an ability to emit to make the phonon flaretons emit into the far field, uh, providing uh, the basis of an electrical uh, uh, electrically pumped phonon flareton mode. So this is uh, one of the other focuses that we're pushing towards now. So to start probing this, we started looking at some of these strongly coupled systems within silicon carbide, exploiting these zone folded modes, right? And so what we find here is we're basically taking the zone folded LO phonon, we're coupling it with a monopole mode, which is a nominally localized mode with some propagating character. But now taking these resonant particles and separating them out at a, uh, uh, within a two-dimensional grating that can provide diffractive effects in the long wave infrared giving us this hybridized mode that we can then hopefully use to design the thermal emission properties and in the end, in the end hopefully result in a means for electrical pumping of these devices. And what you see right here is uh, that three-way uh, uh, strong coupling shown here, where basically this is seven micron grading with about a one and a half or two micron diameter pillar, sorry, I don't remember off the top of my head, uh, with about a one micron tall pillar. You can see a rough schematic of the structure here. And as I tune the angle, I can measure the thermal emission intensity. And you can see I have my grating mode that would ordinarily be dispersive along this blue line. My monopole resonance, which would ordinarily be nominally non-dispersive and flat here. And then the zone folded LFONO, which would also be non-dispersive, right? By incorporating this grating mode, I can now get strong coupling between the monopole and that grating mode. And much like Grafe's work, uh, induce some spatial coherence here. But I can also result, uh, use this to control the lifetime or the quality factor of these resonant nodes, right? While also using this zone folding and its proximity to these uh, flaretonic resonances to tune this around as well. Now, if I look at just pure 3C where these zone folded modes are not present, you can see I still can couple this grating mode to the monopole resonance inducing this dispersion. However, the presence of the zone folded Telephonon actually provides uh, some improvement in the actual uh, quality of these modes and the uh, total absorption of these resonances, uh, in addition to providing an additional de degree of freedom. So now if we look at the overall radiation patterns from these, you can see from these dispersions, if I choose any specific angle or specific mode, I can now uh, pick out how that mode is radiating. So you can see this guy here, which is coupled to this grading mode, I get a relatively narrow angular spread. Uh, whereas in the strong coupling regime, this is somewhat broadened. And now I can start to probe what is it about these various uh, interactions that allows me to induce uh, a given desired angle of emission uh, and also narrows that angular spread. If I want to do on-chip photonics, one of the things you need to do is be able to couple, uh, and you want to use an LED or an LED-like mode, you need to be able to couple into a single spatial mode. And so this is certainly not good enough for that yet but this is one of the approaches is to try to understand the basics behind this so that we can hopefully push in that direction. Okay, so now let's switch gears. We're still gonna stay with thermal emission, but now we're gonna to move towards the three to five micron range. Uh, and we're gonna be necessarily having to switch to a plasmonic medium. Uh, in this case, we're gonna be looking at doped cadmium oxide, uh, which as I'll show you is a really interesting material um, uh, due to the variety of different electronic properties. Uh, but to do this, we want to use nominally flat films. And so one of the things we need to look at was uh, how can we actually uh, use a flat film for realizing thermal emission? And so in doing so, you can uh, couple to what's called an epsilon near zero mode. So here's my uh, surface plasmon polariton dispersion. Uh, this is from a paper from uh, uh, Campione, uh, where you can see the traditional uh, dispersion as we approach uh, within a thick slab. However, if I start shifting towards a, uh, a thin film, I can support flaretons on both the top and bottom interfaces. And when the evanescent fields inside that structure, inside the flaretonic medium, begin to overlap, you get a strong coupling between those two modes. This causes a splitting and results in two different branches. This upper branch is the one that we're going to be focusing on here, leading to this ENZ polariton effect. However, this is still to the uh, right of the light line, and thus you have to overcome the momentum mismatch to couple to that. But as shown in this uh, paper from uh, 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 Professor Grafe's group, you can also see that this uh, corresponds with a uh, 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 what's called the Berman mode, which is to the left of the light line and therefore can be coupled to free space, right? 
And so as I decrease my uh, thickness of my polaritonic layer, these begin to shift towards a more non-dispersive mode that meet close to that light line. All right. So why cadmium oxide? Well, if I look at a plasmonic medium, uh, right, the dispersion is dictated by the Druda uh, formalism, right? Here I can look at this plasma frequency and find it's dictated by the carry density. But the matter in which or how uh, well I can tune this plasma frequency with carry density is dictated by the magnitude of my effective mass. It turns out, because of the Moss-Bernstein effect, as I change the carrier density, um, the uh, mobility of these modes can, uh, I'm sorry, the effective mass of this mode uh, of, the, uh, uh, free of the electrons in the material, uh, sorry, uh, actually changes from about 0.11 to about 0.21. Furthermore, which gives us a broad spectral tunability of the plasmonic resonance or the plasma frequency. Furthermore, as in uh, something that's been seen in a number of transition metal oxides, is that as I increase the carry density, a healing of uh, oxygen vacancies actually occurs, which causes the mobility to increase as opposed to traditionally decreasing as I increase the carry density. So you see this increase in mobility with increasing carry density, even at levels approaching 10 to the 20 uh, free, carrier uh, free carrier concentrations which means this is a nominally low loss material across that entire spectral bandwidth. And if I therefore compare this, you can see a number of these phonon polariton materials here, of course, but N-type cadmium oxide in the mid-infrared is approaching that of uh, uh, silver in the visible for losses. So we can probe these materials here. Uh, this is all in collaboration with John Paul Maria's group at uh, uh, now Penn State. Uh, you can see through, we can couple in the Kretschmann configuration through a calcium fluoride prism through the substrate to launch uh, uh, one of these ENZ modes. Uh, these are three different films with different carrier densities, all with thicknesses below uh, 100 nanometers. And you can see that the uh, actual absorptive resonance uh, observed through this Kretschmann configuration of the ENZ polariton becomes uh, uh, spectrally shifted accordingly. And thus, if I heat this guy up, I get thermal emission resonances where I need them. Uh, as dictated, and it's uh, each of these uh, different layers, if compiled into a three layer structure, actually gives me individual resonances uh, like they have if they were individual structures themselves. So they're nominally non interacting. Now, if I uh, look at the uh, radiation pattern of this, you can see that this comes out at roughly 65 degrees at the Bragg condition, so uh, you don't get near normal light. We have had uh, work with. Uh, overcoming this. I'm not going to have time to talk about that today, but I can discuss offline or in questions if anybody has any questions. So one of the things we wanted to then focus on was can we use strong coupling to now modify this behavior? So in this case, we used a purely cadoxide structure on a R-plane sapphire substrate, taking uh, a thicker layer that supports a surface plasmon flariton. I can then uh, grow a layer on top of that, which is a ENZ polariton layer. And by doing that, I can result in uh, uh, these two, the ENZ uh, polariton and the S uh, surface plasma polariton can strongly couple together, again, leading to this anti-crossing. And one of the interesting aspects of this is that this anti-crossing is on the order uh, of 30% uh, of the operating frequency, which uh, means that this is approaching something uh, uh, close to that of ultra strong coupling. Now, if I, uh, we can control that strength of the interaction by, uh, for instance, tuning the oscillator strength of the uh, uh, ENZ layer. Uh, simply by thinning that layer down, I've reduced the number of emitters, if you will, and therefore the strength of that coupling is reduced. Uh, you can see here there's almost no splitting between these two modes at uh, 20 nanometer layer thickness. But I can also tune the strength of this coupling by changing the free carrier density, right? And so by, of the ENZ layer. So as I tune this through, I'm actually transitioning uh, the ENZ dispersion uh, or the ENZ mode through the plasmonic dispersion. And thus I can dictate where in spatial coordinates as well as frequency coordinates that strong coupling occurs. Now, if I'm looking at thermal emission from these structures, these are the ENZ polaritons, which I observed through uh, correction configuration. These are not what you're actually going to be observing in thermal emission. Instead, this ever shows up. Um, my computer's hanging. 
Instead, if this will ever show up, I apologize. You actually can see, um, what's going on? You can see that the, uh, um, uh, this, the strong coupling leads to a uh, the Berman mode as well. I'm not sure why this is. Sorry about this. Computer's locking up. Uh, hang on. Come on. Sincerely apologize about this. I'm not sure what's Problems. going on. Say again. Any problem? Yeah, the screen is locking up on me. Um, I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, give me a second. Come on. Come on, please. Uh, okay, can you see now? Hopefully. Yep. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Um, I can't begin. Uh, okay, so if you see uh, here, we're actually going to be looking at the Berman modes in these cases, which are off to the uh, left of the light line. So as we have a thicker film, these guys actually have some dispersion to them, uh, and thus they're going to occur at frequencies uh, redshifted from that of the ENZ flareton mode. And it's locking up again. Uh, I apologize. Hang on one second. I don't know what happened. Um, there you go. Uh, sorry, guys. No worries. There we go. Was I was right here. Here we go. All right. Uh, so yeah, here we go. You see that uh, all of the modes actually occur to. Uh, we are seeing. We are seeing you, Josh. <sighs> oh, it stopped the share. The screen sharing. Sorry about that. Uh, share. Never had this happen before. Yeah. But, uh, Yep. There we go. Yep. Now it's okay. All right. So sorry about that. We're actually going to be looking at the Berman modes, if you uh, will, here, where we're looking in this upper quadrant. Um, and so because of the dispersion of these modes here, right, these are all going to be spectrally redshifted. And that's what we observe here. OK. Uh, now, we also were able to demonstrate this within phonon flareton systems. Uh, shown here is uh, an ENZ layer of a thin aluminum nitride layer on a uh, phonon flareton uh, layer of silicon carbide. And in collaboration with Alex Parman's group, uh, we were able to demonstrate, and uh, Simone, we were able to demonstrate in the auto configuration uh, the overall dispersion of these modes. And again, the control of the oscillator strength by changing the thickness of that top layer controls the strength of that uh, strong coupling. And again, I'll just point out one of the key benefits of these strongly coupled systems is that you result in uh, multiple branches of these modes, which then take on uh, hybridized properties of the two constituent layers. OK, so as long as it's continuing, uh, I will now switch to the last topic, which is uh, hexagonal boron nitride will hopefully get the time to get into uh, some of the um, uh, on-chip photonic concepts. So it turns out uh, hexagonal boron nitride is a uh, naturally hyperbolic medium. Uh, to understand that, we're going to start with uh, anisotropy in the crystal structure. Uh, sticking with silicon carbide, you can see this anisotropic crystal structure, which means that light along one axis will propagate at a different speed than the other, and therefore the permittivities along those axes are different. I can compare that to diamond, where it's isotropic. And in the visible, silicon carbide, 4-H silicon carbide and diamond have roughly the same uh, uh, refractive index on the order of 2.4, uh, leading to this uh, brilliance within gemstones that you ordinarily see. However, due to the birefringence, or this uh, uh, 
uh, crystal anisotropy, 4-H silicon carbide actually gives this prismatic effect as it separates out the colors due to the light traveling at different speeds and the dispersion in that permittivity. So if you learn nothing else from me today, especially where my screen will probably lock up again in a minute, just remember that moissanite, which is silicon carbide gemstone, uh, actually makes a prettier gemstone than diamond. It's about 10 to 100 times cheaper and comes with none of the politics. So that's a good start. But now if we shift over to uh, hexagonal boron nitride, we find it actually has, because of this, uh, um, uh, the van der Waals bonds out of plane and strong covalent bonds in plane, we end up with two Rostralin bands, an upper and a lower band. And if we look at the dielectric function, the in-plane band has a permittivity that's negative or metallic-like in-plane, while it's positive out of plane, and the opposite true in this type one lower band. This uh, uh, is what is the definition of a hyperbolic medium, whereby not only are the permittivities along orthogonal directions uh, different, but they're actually opposite in sign. So why is this important? Well, if I look at a traditional isotropic medium and I look at what's called an isofrequency contour, if I have all my permittivities negative and uh, equi uh, equivalent along all three axes, this means that my wavelength of the mode is uh, gonna be fixed. And you can see that from this dispersion here, right? So this is just, again, the dispersion of a plasmon flariton. If I stick at an isofrequency, so a single frequency, I can find that the momentum of that mode is gonna be fixed, right? And it's fixed by this dispersion. And therefore, that momentum, which is just the reciprocal of the uh, uh, flariton wavelength, is also gonna be fixed. However, I can get that mode to propagate in any direction, right? So any direction uh, space, it can propagate. One of the interesting aspects of these hyperbolic materials and also where they get their uh, name is that if one of these permittivities is negative while the other is positive, you end up with an hy open hyperboloid uh, shape for the uh, isofrequency contour. So to visualize what that means, means I can support arbitrarily large K, but the direction of propagation is fixed because uh, the pointing vector is gonna be perpendicular or tangential to this uh, uh, isofrequency surface. So I end up with a dispersion for a finite thickness slab that looks like this, right? Where not only do I have that original fundamental mode, but I have all these additional higher order modes that occur. So at any given frequency, I can support a broad variety of different momentum modes uh, with smaller and smaller wavelengths, right? Now, what does that actually look like when I talk about that angle of propagation? Uh, so in this work, in collaboration with Thomas Tobner, um, we explored this a little bit for the hyperlensing concept, but the key idea here is the angle of propagation is proportional to the square root of the ratio of the permittivities, the in and out of plane. Right? Now, because one of these is negative and uh, highly dispersive, while the other is positive and nominally non-dispersive, this means that this angle of propagation becomes a function of frequency within these two Rostralin bands. So if I'm near the TO phonon in the lower Rostralin or the LO phonon in the upper Rostralin, if I launch a uh, hyperbolic pho phonon polariton through some scattering element, and it propagates through a slab of boron nitride, it'll propagate directly up to the top surface with something close to zero degree uh, transition. However, if I shift somewhere inside this band, you see that it will propagate at a fixed angle that's dictated by that dielectric function and the frequency of operation. So why does that result in a, uh, 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 this weird dispersion? Instead of having a continuum of states, why do I end up with distinct states? Well, if I look at a constant frequency, right, I have this propagation that looks like this. It's a fixed angle. Um, so each one of these branches is going to be where I can set up a Fabry Perot like resonance, where I can support a single wavelength, two wavelengths, three wavelengths, and so on and so forth along that trajectory, giving rise to these discrete uh, branches. Right? And you can figure out the wavelength of that mode by looking at your. Uh, uh, which mode you're talking about and the overall uh, uh, modal number that you're looking at. If I look at a constant wave vector, I now need to tilt that uh, angle of propagation to support that additional wavelength, uh, to support that same wavelength, but multiple orders of that mode, hence leading to this overall discrete uh, structure as shown here. One of the interesting aspects of this, it means that your dispersion is now therefore going to be uh, dictated uh, by the thickness of your slab. 
So to probe these systems, we're going to use uh, scattering near-field optical microscopy. Um, the idea here is I have a metallized AFM tip. I bring in an infrared light, uh, mid-infrared laser light source. I scatter it off of that tip. And much like throwing rock in the water, it's going to lead to this radial pattern of uh, modes propagating away from that tip. Um, now, if I introduce some kind of uh, reflective edge, for instance, the edge of a flake, or if I use, uh, for instance, a, um, a, a, a defect or a fold in the material, I can get that to uh, scatter back. And the interference between the outgoing and returning polariton modes results in this interference pattern, which I can then use by scanning across the whole structure or a whole flake here to identify the uh, periodicity of these modes, right? And by looking at the distance between any two fringes, I can now look at, um, uh, uh, figure out the overall wavelength, convert that to momentum, and now plot out the dispersion. And we're going to be using uh, 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 lower loss um, uh, hexagonal boron nitride, which is provided by Jim Edgar, which is isotopically enriched, right? So as you can see here, by uh, hexagonal boron nitride and boron, is naturally about 80% boron-11 and 20% boron-10 isotopes. And so if I make this purely boron-10, I can shift this uh, LO phonon to very high frequencies and significantly narrow the line width by reducing scattering. Or purely boron-11, I can do the opposite and shift this to lower frequencies, right? And you can see that uh, corresponding shift in the Rishalem bands is shown here. And this also can provide uh, significant improvements in lifetime. And we've seen about a three, uh, three to four fold improvement in the lifetime. Uh, more recent results have shown this to be even better um, with the promise of getting up to about 14 fold. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on this other than just to show the line scans of these. These are scanning near field optical microscope maps of boron 10 enriched, boron 11 enriched, and naturally ab uh, abundant. You can see these long, prop much longer propagating modes which also support these higher order resonances that are present within these structures, right? For the first time, you could actually directly observe these. Okay, so now for the, hopefully if I can steal a couple extra minutes due to my computer snafu, uh, we were motivated by some work from Thomas Tobner where he used uh, phonon, surface phonon flaretons on the surface of quartz and used the phase change material uh, GST to be able to manipulate those modes. And right, uh, he was able to do laser writing uh, to convert morphous to crystalline GST, and thus control the propagation of these phonon flaretons. One of the challenges though, was that because the surface phonon flareton is on the surface of the quartz, in the crystalline state, the GST is quite lossy in the spectral region and therefore doesn't support the flareton mode. Um, so we then transitioned said, if we used uh, hexagonal boron nitride or a hyperbolic medium where the modes propagate through the volume, can I now use this uh, for the same purpose, but using vanadium oxide as my phase change material. So here we have a single crystal of vanadium oxide. We transferred a slab of hexagonal boron nitride onto the surface. And here's a scanning near field optical microscope image of room temperature where you can see these hyperbolic flaretons propagating inside the volume of this uh, boron nitride crystal. But as I increase the temperature, I start to introduce these metallic domains. And you can see that uh, uh, both in the boron nitride over the dielectric and metallic domains that you can support these polaritonic modes, but now they have different wavelengths and therefore different momenta, right? And so one of the interesting things that comes out of that is if I launch a mode in the dielectric regime, it comes to this interface because of the momentum mismatch between the two modes, it has to refract. And thus, this refraction enables us to use standard optical concepts uh, uh, used in the far field, but now on chip, right? So for instance, by uh, creating waveguides of material uh, in GST using cubic versus uh, amorphous phase or vanadium dioxide, you can induce an optical waveguide. You could create resonators without having to do any patterning of the boron nitride, therefore saving damage to the system, create lensing effects uh, and things like that. And this was actually experimentally demonstrated not too long ago. Sorry, I should have updated this reference. It's now published uh, by Federico Capasso's group. Here's some waveguides and also some convex and con uh, cave lenses in this material. And so uh, it, we were able to then, uh, in collaboration with Johannes Abade's group, uh, look at a broad variety of different substrates 
and determine what is the influence of the actual substrate upon this. And this is what's leading us to some of these on-chip photonic applications, right? Where now what we can do is take this analytical expression, which in uh, from uh, Fossil's group, which incorporates this substrate permittivity, and at a given frequency, look at how the polaritonic mode, uh, uh, the momentum of that mode, is modified by the underlying substrate. And you can normalize this to the thickness in this case. And thus I can see as I increase the dielectric momentum, uh, the dielectric permittivity, that the momentum begins to saturate. In contrast, as I look, uh, however, if I have a metallic substrate, we actually see that it will do uh, uh, the inverse of this. So it promises us the opportunity to get to really small flareton wavelengths simply by transitioning from a dielectric to a metallic regime. Now we looked at silver, but of course in the infrared, silver has such a large negative permittivity that it doesn't look any different than a dielectric with such a permittivity. And so uh, we used cadmium oxide as the substrate, as I showed you before, and have been able to demonstrate that this significantly shrinks the wavelength and you can control this by carrier density, which I will show maybe two slides left. Uh, first, we have uh, now been able to demonstrate that using cadmium oxide, if you have a uh, separation between two different carrier densities, here, the left-hand side is a mode where the plasma frequency is below that of the upper restrolin of boron nitride, so leads to this dispersion shown here. The right is one where uh, the mode is um, propagating inside, uh, uh, the, the positive frequency is inside that. We actually end up with a strong coupling phenomena between these two modes, which causes a band where the fundamental mode cannot be supported. And thus, I can stimulate the mode within the left-hand side, right, where cat oxide is behaving like a dielectric, but that fundamental, the first order mode cannot propagate across and refract across that interface, leading to a modal filter uh, that could be potentially realized within these structures. And so we can therefore then look at creating waveguides here. And I'll just show these very quickly here. This is actually work with uh, uh, Sharon Weiss and Dmitry Basov, uh, where we took silicon photonic waveguides that uh, are used in the near infrared and transferred hexagonal boron nitride onto the surface that can support uh, hyperbolic phonon polaritons in these modes. And what we found is that the hyperbolic phonon polariton is entirely guided by the underlying silicon mode, uh, uh, silicon structure. And so without fabricating the boron nitride at all, we can now induce uh, the hyperbolic phonon polariton to follow the same trajectory as the near infrared light. But now because we're using a polaritonic mode, we can shrink that wavelength down so that it's commensurate with the modal wavelength inside the silicon waveguide in the near infrared, despite the large free space wavelength tran uh, transitions. And I don't have much time, but I will show uh, that this is certainly operating as a waveguide mode. Um, we looked at the frequency dispersion of this and compared this to analytical expressions. This is currently uh, submitted work uh, where you can see we see the first and second order waveguide modes that fall in between the dispersion of uh, the boron nitride modes on silicon versus those on uh, uh, air. And so this truly behaves like a waveguide. It also will propagate around curved trajectories. This will ever show up. Um, I don't know what's up with my computer today, um, but we've shown that it works around curved trajectories and uh, therefore uh, can be incorporated for a number of different applications. And with that, I'm just going to uh, shift beyond. I'd like to thank my group, um, especially uh, 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 the students shown here, uh, as well as my postdoc, Tom Foland, who's about to take on a faculty position at the University of Iowa. Um, always looking for new additions and visitors if COVID ever lets us travel again. Uh, love to have you in the lab if there's work you want to do. Uh, and then I've had the great pleasure of interacting with some fantastic researchers over the years. Uh, in fact, all three of the uh, uh, organizers for this. And so I'll be happy to answer any questions you have and sorry for the snafus with my computer. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Josh, for the great talk. Uh, very much appreciated. I'm sure the, the public will agree. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. Uh, I remember you can either write voice uh, and uh, I'll 
allow you to ask your question or you can write your question and I will read it aloud. Uh, I, we have the first uh, two questions from the same person. Can you please tell us more about how to estimate momentum of uh, hyperbolic phonon polaritons uh, in the nanopattern of uh, HBN analytically and how to change the isotopic stoichiometry in HBN? Oh, so the second question is the easier one. Uh, that's actually through uh, the collaboration with Jim Edgar at Kansas State. Um, so in that case, you just, you have to purchase uh, boron that is isotopically enriched or monoisotopic uh, to start with. Uh, there are some modifications to, you know, growth crucibles and things like that, uh, so that you, uh, a lot of times you use a boron nitride crucible, which would have naturally abundant uh, uh, availability of uh, uh, the boron. Uh, so you obviously can't use that if you want to do the enrichment. Um, so you have to change the crucible, but outside of that, it's more about just getting uh, replacing your boron source to be one that's uh, isotopically enriched. Uh, the first question was more about analytically identifying the resonance. Uh, the resonance how, of the how to estimate uh, momentum of hyperbolic phonon polaritons in the nanopattern analytically? Uh, I guess the question is, um, are we talking about this work here or localized resonances? Um, if we're talking about in this case here uh, for the waveguide physics, this is just using a, a simple waveguide model, but now incorporating the polaritonic or the permittivity of the boron nitride and uh, uh, the permittivities of the underlying silicon and suspended air. I didn't get to spend too much time on this, if this will ever go back. Um, but here, let me do this. Then I can. Uh, Exit. Uh, hopefully you can still see my screen. Yes. Okay. So maybe this will be easier just to transition between slides this way. Um, so there's an analytical expression here that as a function of the permittivity of your substrate and the uh, in-plane permittivity of your hyperbolic mode, you can actually begin to account for uh, how the polaritonic dispersion changes, or in this case, it's just at a single frequency, but you can do this calculation for a number of different frequencies as a function of the permittivity. When you look at um, uh, these structures here, uh, my student Mingzhou is able to use uh, just simple waveguide theory and the corresponding dielectric functions of the materials incorporated uh, to therefore calculate out the dispersion of the, the propagating hyperbolic phonon polariton modes um, based off of the local environment. Um, I didn't talk about it too much, but uh, effectively in this case, your core is your silicon is the boron nitride over the silicon, uh, whereas your cladding is the boron nitride over a suspended area. And just like a waveguide, you find a, uh, a polaritonic uh, wave -like, uh, wavelength that falls between the bulk uh, polariton on air or the bulk polariton on silicon. And that dispersion there transitions uh, depending on uh, uh, where you are in momentum space. Hopefully that answered the question. If not, uh, uh, please feel free to ask again. We have uh, the following question in the meanwhile. Um, regarding the first part, uh, which is the origin of the monopole mode? So the monopole mode is actually a uh, probably should have incorporated that, I apologize. Um, let me bring this image up. The monopole mode is what you ordinarily would consider your longitudinal mode. Um, so it's the uh, resonance, uh, the dipole resonance along the length of your nanopillar. However, in silicon carbide, especially with 4-H silicon carbide, you fabricate these structures into uh, um, uh, the silicon carbide substrate itself. So, this isn't silicon carbide pillars on, say, glass. This is silicon carbide pillars on silicon carbide. And as such, um, what you actually find is that that modifies that and couples into a propagating mode. Uh, so you have a localized propagating character to this that gives a monopole resonance. So if you think of a monopole uh, RF antenna, this is a uh, dipole antenna on a metallic ground plane. It's the same concept where now I have a monopole, a dipole antenna 
on a metallic ground plane, except my metal is an optical metal at these frequencies. And so the key outshot of using this monopole mode is that the individual pillars provided their space uh, within uh, the distance of the propagation of that polariton will start to couple together and interact, leading to a collective monopole resonance. Next question, uh, by Alex Parman. You talked about electrical pumping of phonon polariton light emission for the zone folded silicon carbide modes. How about uh, the phononic Bergman modes, which are also LO phonon derived? Even more so, I suppose uh, the cadmium oxide epsilon near zero modes also have some longitudinal character. Is there an analogy for plasmonic systems? Um, so certainly you could look at uh, uh, inducing uh, such a, a, a zone folding through uh, super lattice uh, construction. You also can pretend, you can also couple into a plasmonic system uh, because of the longitudinal fields uh, you're using free carriers. Um, it's more in this sense of using a uh, phonon polariton that that really becomes a problem because you have this transverse optical mode uh, a nature of the phonon polariton mode, which does not uh, enable itself to be easily coupled to uh, uh, electronic fields. And so it's a way to overcome some of those limitations and gain the benefit of those very narrow line widths. Um, I can't speak too much to the electrical stimulation of the Berman modes at this point. It's something we're currently working on. Um, I'd love to speculate on it, but uh, we're actually in the process of doing the experiment. So hopefully we'll have an answer uh, within the next couple of months. Um, next question. By the way, if you want me to read your name, uh, write your name inside the question. Since you couple the modes in HBN with cavity modes, could you tell how much is the E field of the HPP mode leaking out the HBN slab? Is there a yeah. simple formula to estimate the typical length outside the slab? like for example the one you have uh, for surface plasmons um at least to, uh i actually so we've been using mostly electromagnetic simulations to uh validate that um so i'll put a caveat on this that um the uh, the simple analytical expressions for say the z extent of the evanescent field for a surface plasmon or a surface phonon flareton uh, can give you a good estimation of this. The volume confinement of that does modify things. Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember exactly. Um, but of course, the same general trends hold that, you know, as I met very, very low uh, frequencies and thus my permittivity, uh, the negative part of my permittivity is quite large. Um, I'm going to have a very weakly confined mode as I go to uh, closer to the yellow phonon where uh, the negative part of my per permittivity shrinks uh, becomes very small. I'm going to have a very highly confined mode. Uh, so the degree, and in fact, you can actually see, if I go back to that, you can see that behavior in the waveguide mode. Where is it? Right here, the waveguide dispersion where uh, this transitions from something more like uh, that where the suspended Permittivity is playing a sig uh, this, uh, the air around it plays a significant role at lower frequencies where it's more extended, uh, whereas it becomes much more confined and approaches that of just the mode in, on silicon as you get to higher momenta where it's much more confined. I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. I need to look into uh, if how exact the analytical expression is, and I don't know off the top of my head. Next question uh, from uh, Eugenio Calandrini from Paris. Uh, is the thermal emitter device, uh, did you consider the thermal behavior of the material properties? Can you repeat the second part, of, uh, the last part of that, sorry. In the uh, thermal emitter device, uh, did you yep. consider the thermal behavior of the material properties? Yes, uh, so actually you can see, uh, when I get back to that, um, and here, you can see uh, these top two graphs here. This is uh, this column is for the nano pillar device. This is just for silicon carbide itself. Down here, you can actually see uh, the full 
Uh, this is roughly four microns to 20 microns, of which at these temperatures you have you know, reasonable amount of thermal energy. And you can see there's certainly some uh, uh, temperature dependence, uh, temperature dependent change in the emissivity in the bulk material outside of that Ristralin band. And so when we uh, did the uh, calculations here, we recalculated the dielectric function incorporating these temperature dependent effects. So we basically calculated the dielectric function at each of these different temperatures that we probed to account for that in the total emissivity of the device and how much power we could get out. Uh, no further questions? Well, if so, uh, with this we are done. We all thank uh, again Professor Caldwell for the great talk and uh, we hope uh, you will be with us next week for the talk by Professor Thomas Taubner titled Probing Ultra-Confined and Switchable Surface Phonon Polaritons on bulk crystals with near-field optical microscopy. Details of the talk will be announced on my Twitter account and on the event page on Facebook. And with this, thank you very much and see you next week. Thanks.